So I said there were three relevant questions, existence, uniqueness, and stability. Uh, but uh, I have actually a fourth uh, bonus question, and this is going to be about the error conversions. So the answers to the first three questions, uh, they were really just about the partial differential equation, independent of our use of a finite element method to solve for it. But this fourth question really relies or it, it, it's based on the notion of a discretization. Yeah? So we have some discrete approximation to our true solution, which we know exists, which we know is unique, and which we know has a certain sensitivity to the data. And given that we have a, uh, a finite element approximation to this solution, how well can we assume that this solution approximates the true solution? And, and more specifically, uh, once we start to refine our mesh, how can we, uh, what kind of uh, convergence might we expect? So this is a very big branch uh, of research and mathematics uh, in, in relation to finite element theory. Uh, and there's a, really a lot to say about it. Um, I'll give you one example, a pretty straightforward, simple example. Again, this is a proof that you can memorize. It's just a couple of lines that should give you a very clear initial idea of what these proofs in general might look like uh, and, and is something that you can almost always uh, sort of whip up uh, to get a, a feeling for what kind of convergence you might expect for problems that you run into yourself. Okay, so the question of error convergence uh, revolves around how does the error u minus u h decrease with h? How does the error which we define as E is equal to the true solution U minus our discrete solution UH decrease with H. And H is our mesh size. So I have two, uh, two equations that I know hold. Well, in general, our bilinear form for the true solution U Hope you can see the mouse satisfies b u w is equal to l w for all w in well our infinite dimensional solar space so this has to hold now we know actually something else holds as well b u h w is equal to l w for all w not an h one zero but in that discrete space. And this is the discrete space that we talked about two videos before. Yeah, the first video, the one on existence. So this is a subspace of H10, but compiled of a bunch of basis functions, right? This was the span of a whole bunch of basis functions. So our true solution has to satisfy this bilinear form equal in this linear form for infinitely many functions as test functions. And the second line uh, also satisfies the same relation, but for, for far fewer functions, right? This was a finite dimensional function space. There's only, uh, it's spanned by a, a finite number of bases. Okay, so what I can do is I can subtract the two. Now, then the right-hand side is gonna be equal to zero. And on the left, I have B u minus u h comma w and this is now is going to be equal to zero for all functions w in w h right so not for all functions w in h10 because the second line wasn't true for all functions w in h10 but both lines are true for all functions w in in the space w h yeah because again w h is a subspace of h10 now of course this is again our error e and this notion that somehow our error satisfies this weighted measure being equal to zero, that is what we call Galerkin orthogonality. Somehow if we plug in our error in the first slot of our bilinear form, uh, then if we measure that or we wait, we choose any weighting function w in our finite dimensional space, uh, then that is going to be zero. It's going to be orthogonal to that in a Galerkin sense. 
Now, this is something that we're going to use in a uh, first statement in terms of error conversions. And again, I'm going to need some properties uh, that we've talked about before, the coercivity and the boundedness. So the coercivity says that if I substitute the same function in both slots, and let me now substitute the error. Let me substitute in both slots E. So I have E and E. Then that's going to be larger than or equal to our coercivity constant C times the norm of that function, E. So now I'll, I'll, I'll play a trick much like the one that we used for the stability analysis. I'm going to flip this around. So I will, I will write C, C, E, H1 square. It's going to be then also flipped smaller than or equal to the bilinear form of the error times the error. Well, that is going to be equal to the bilinear form of the error and the error plus this statement, or plus the Galerkian orthogonality term. Because that is going to be zero, so I can add that. So plus the bilinear form of E and W. And that is going to be true for all cho choices of W in this discrete space. So now I will choose W It's going to be equal to um, our solution UH uh, minus any other function, VH. And that's what I'm going to choose. Uh, that's what I'm going to substitute for W. Right? This has to be true for all W, so I can make a choice, and it still has to be true. And I'll choose UH minus some other function, VH. So then, this is going to be equal to B times E. And then I can add these two, and due to the bilinearity, right? So I have the, the same uh, component in the first slot, so I can, can add the other two. Well, what was this? This was uh, U minus UH, and now with my choice of, of W, plus UH minus VH, right? So these cancel, and that's what I'm left with. And now I'll use the second property of our bilinear form, this boundedness property. Uh, so this is going to be smaller than or equal to our boundedness coefficient uh, times the norm of the error measured in H1, uh, not square, sorry, but rather multiplied by the norm of well, what was in the right hand slot, the right slot here, that's U minus VH norm of that function, also in H1. So again, we have this string here of, of inequalities, but they're all pointing in the same direction. So I end up with CC times the norm of the error is going to be smaller than CB times the norm of the error times the norm of that function. So let me write that out. So we have CC times the norm of the error square is going to be smaller than CB times the norm of the error as the norm of u minus vh. Well, I can sort of play the same trick. I cancel this e with the square. I divide both sides by the coercivity constant, and I get that the error, the magnitude of the error in the h1 sense, is going to be smaller than cb over cc times the norm of this, this interesting quantity here, u minus vh. And again, this has to be true for all choices VH in our discrete space. Yeah? This was true for all uh, functions W and H1. Then I made a particular choice, but in principle, my choice for VH is free. As it's true for any, any choice of VH as long as that lives in this space WH. So, well, when is this a relevant statement? Well, I'm, I'm looking for the, tight, the, the tightest bound on my, uh, my error. So I'm looking for uh, the equation that's going to give me the most information, that's going to be the tightest bound. So that is going to be uh, the minimal value of the minimal 
Uh, we know it, I'll, I'll be very careful with my, my use of word of minimal and maximal. So I'm gonna switch to using the supremum, which we saw already, that's sort of equivalent to maximum, but uh, then for infinite dimensional spaces. And um, the infimum is the equivalent to the minimal. So we have for the infimum inf of u minus vh. So this is saying the magnitude of our error measured in an h1 sense is bound from above by this, this constant multiplied by the minimal of this one. And if you look at this, this is the minimal error in h1, right? So this we can plug all kinds of functions in here. And all of these are sort of error quantities. So now we're saying that the error that we are making with our finite element formulation is going to be bound from above by some constant of multiplication by the best possible approximation. So this is the best possible approximation. And now we're going to have to sort of figure out a, a, a relation between the best possible approximation and our mesh size h, because we're interested in uh, convergence. So what happens with mesh refinement? Now, this is a whole field, again, of, of mathematics that is about interpolation uh, theory, uh, which I'm not going to bore you with. Uh, but uh, one of the main results that I, I would like to uh, emphasize here is that uh, a, a, a mathematical limit to the best approximation in a general sense is that uh, this best approximation in the H1 norm is going to be smaller than or equal to some, some mesh dependent or mesh independent uh, constant CH multiplied by our mesh size H. So this is a, an interpolation interpolation limit. For an arbitrary function u, this is a hard limit. So uh, what we end up saying here is that the error that we will make in our finite element approximation measured in h1 sense is going to be bound from above by CB times CH divided by CC times the mesh size. And again, this is now in, in the H1 sense. And this is then, yeah, okay, in the H1 sense. So the one that you might also be familiar with is if we measure our errors in an L2 sense. And then we find that it's going to be bound from above by a very similar expression, CB, uh, divided by cc times a new constant c, which is also uh, relates to this interpolation limit of h squared. And then, so this is essentially h to the power 1, and the other one is h to the power 2. Now, this one follows from the derivation that I showed you a second ago. And uh, this is essentially a derivation proposed by someone called Sea. So this is Sea's lemma. Uh, lemma. And I think uh, uh, Sia uh, did this in, in his PhD work, if I'm not mistaken. So it's a pretty straightforward set of steps, uh, relying only on the, the coercivity and the boundedness of our bilinear form, uh, by which we can already obtain some measure or some convergence idea of our error in H1 sense, in a natural norm. Now, the, the extension to L2, that's actually not so straightforward. And uh, I'm not going to talk about that one. Uh, but I still wanted to uh, actually highlight that this exponent is different. And this exponent is called the convergence rate. So what we're seeing is that if we measure our error in an H1 sense, then we have a, in H1 sense, uh, then we have a convergence rate of 1. And if we measure it in an L2 sense, then we have a convergence rate of 2. And actually, I'm, I'm being a bit uh, uh, too, too, too rigorous here. 
uh, this should be p plus 1 and p plus 2 sorry p no, sorry, this is p and p plus 1 p and p plus 1 where p is the polynomial order of our basis functions. So if we're using linear basis functions, then p is equal to 1, and then we obtain expressions that have a second row, so h1, h to the power 1 and h to the power 2. And the same thing, uh, I think that uh, any numerical analysis uh, analyst uh, should be uh, familiar with, the standard convergence rates. So there's the convergence rate of p plus 1 in an L2 sense, any convergence rate of p uh, in h1 sense. And this follows again very quickly, very naturally, pretty much from a one-line statement here, in combination with uh, this interpolation uh, uh, theory, the, the limit of the interpolation. Um, and that is a hard limit in the sense that for an arbitrary solution u, you will not be able to get uh, an approximation that converges faster than uh, h to the power p in, in the natural norm, if, if we're talking about regular uh, refinement. So there's a limit based on just how well uh, basis or how well uh, polynomial basis can approximate any function. Now the other thing that's important is, so here we have uh, one important thing being the convergence rate, and the other thing of important importance is here the other factor involved. And that is going to be the constant of proportionality. Constant of proportionality. Now clearly, if this is a very large value, so if this constant is very large, then we have very little claim on how small the error is going to be. Uh, it's going to be smaller than... Uh, some very large value multiplied by our mesh size. So we want this constant of proportionality to be small. We want to have a small factor so that we have a tight bound on our error. Um, now, again, what are the, the factors that come into this constant of proportionality? Again, we see that this coercivity constant uh, shows up under, under the division. We also now have this boundedness uh, coefficient, uh, Cb, and we have the CH. Now, CH is something that, again, involves the interpolation uh, error. Um, there's little that we can do about this. This is a, a hard limit in terms of how well a polynomial can approximate the function. But CB and CC, they, again, uh, involve the, par uh, the, the, the partial differential equation. And we'll actually see that we'll be able to create finite element methods that uh, have a slightly altered structures so that we can change this CC and this CB. That's what's going to be this, this notion of stability. The, this, we're going to stabilize this formulation, thereby changing their coercivity and the, uh, the, uh, the boundedness, so that we can sort of try and get smaller values of constant uh, of proportionality and get a, a tighter relation on, on the error. And also, again, uh, looking back at the, the previous video, uh, let's uh, have a, a more stable form. Okay, so I think this is uh, roughly what I had in mind for this series on, on functional analysis. Um, starting with the definition of a functional, we looked at the, the, uh, the domain of functionals being these function spaces. Uh, we saw that partial differential equations can be represented as um, functional bilinear functionals equal linear functionals. And then we, we took a look at how we can then analyze these functional analysis. Uh, and where we looked at existence, uniqueness, stability, and even now already towards uh, error convergence. So I think this kind of wraps up that little series. Uh, so now that we've built up this knowledge, this theory, uh, we can start to apply it uh, to our partial differential equations uh, that we're interested in, right? these prototypical ones, and then we'll see uh, where the issues that we saw before, where they actually originate from. And that's what we'll, we'll do in the, in the subsequent videos. Okay, thank you for your attention and until next time.